Hey, welcome back to the channel. In this week's video, we're taking a look at hyperopia and what it should mean to you as an optician. Hey, I'm Sean Lestar from ModernOptician.com, where we help student opticians achieve their goals through study guides, books, and online resources just like this one. So if you find value in this video, make sure to smash the like button, subscribe, and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our videos as they drop every week. Let's jump into this presentation about hyperopia. All right, here we are in the presentation about hyperopia. So in the last couple of weeks, we've talked about normal vision, we've talked about myopia, and I guess you're probably starting to get the hint that we're going to be covering all the refractive errors, kind of going through the little nuances as to what makes them special and especially what we should know about them as opticians. So before we get started in this presentation, I wanted to mention that hyperopia is probably one of the more challenging ones that people or students tend to struggle with without even realizing it. Uh, it's one of those where I see students all the time miss kind of judge what a prescription means, especially when you see plus power, which we're going to see a little bit later, kind of denotes hyperopia and calling it reading glasses and things like that. And it's not necessarily correct. And once we kind of link the anatomy and the optics in this lecture and you kind of see how the whole thing kind of unfolds, you're going to have a much better understanding of what hyperopia means and how to correct it and how to advise for it. Uh, and also a big thing here, and this is going to be more of an exciting thing for you as a student, if you can hammer out this hyperopia stuff and you can become an expert on it, you will be further ahead than most of the opticians you work with. I know, bold claim. However, stay tuned. You're going to see uh, where a lot of this stuff gets kind of misrepresented. And as you're working in a dispensary, you're probably going to notice some colleagues that are not really handling this the right way. Anyways, let's jump into it. And of course, before we get started into the lecture, a uh, quick reminder about the resources available to you as a student optician in the form of study guides and books. And of course, this lecture follows very closely to the workbook one ocular anatomy of the study guides for apprentice opticians. There are pages specifically designed to go over hyperopia and test your knowledge on it and kind of get you going through some exercises. So make sure to check it out at modernoptician.com or if you prefer the, the paperback version, head over to Amazon and you will be able to get it from there. All right, let's jump into it now. Okay, just like in the other lectures, we're going to go over hyperopia simplified, meaning we're going to take a look at what most students think of hyperopia, and then we're going to start to expand on it as the lecture goes on as to what good opticians should think of when they think of hyperopia. So if we pull up the image like we did in nearsightedness or in myopia, where the person driving, if you remember in, in myopia, the distance was blurry and the dash was clear. Well, in this case, the dash is blurry and the distance is clear. And this is where the term farsightedness comes from. And if you remember from last lecture, I talked about how I'm not, I, I don't mind the term nearsightedness to describe myopia. However, I cannot stand the term farsightedness because this isn't this insinuates that distance vision is 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 clear and that the eye is adjusted to distance vision this isn't completely wrong in the sense that yes most hyperopes at a certain time in their lives will see better in the distance than they do up close however it's bad as far as describing the optics that are going on. And sure, if you're a layman, if you're just if you're a patient and you want to call your vision farsightedness, I guess that's okay. But as an optician, you should know better. Um, so we're going to kind of expand a little bit as to why farsightedness is not a great term to describe hyperopia. And of course, if you're following in, you know, in your studies and you're looking in different literature, the general way of describing hyperopia is that when parallel rays of light come to the eye, they are converged just like in every other scenario here. However, they fall behind the retina and once again, forming a blurry image. And, you know, the solution is to add a plus lens in front, thus bringing the rays of light onto the retina. So, sure, if you understand it this way, well, you're not alone. Most students and actually most opticians kind of understand it this way. However, you should know by now that we're going to dig deeper and let's do it right now. 
And so this is a great opportunity to look at the mechanism of hyperopia, just like we did in the previous lectures. So again, let's pull up the schematic of the normal eye. Parallel rays of light converge onto the retina. Great. However, what goes on in hyperopia? Well, in a lot of hyperopia, the rays of light converge behind the retina because the eye, the axial length of the eye ends up being a little bit smaller than what we would consider normal. Remember in myopia, we talked about longer axial length, myopes having bigger eyes. In hyperopia, again, it's the same way as in myopia. It could be refractive or it could be axial. Uh, again, don't look at your patients and say, hey, that one's got small eyes, so therefore they must be hyperopic. doesn't really translate that way. But for the most part, the important concept to understand is that the, just like in myopia, the refractive power of the eye is not right. The 42 here and the 20 here is not right for the overall axial length of the eye. So that could be stemming from a, a shorter eye. That could be stemming from different refractive powers of the refractive elements of the eye. Again, it doesn't fully matter as to why. All we care in the, at the end of the day is that the rays of light converge behind the retina. So, uh, as I mentioned, the optics of the eye are too weak for the focal length. And so, therefore, less plus equals less convergence. What I mean by that is, if you remember, and again, the big take-home message in all the refractive error lectures that we cover is that the eye's job is to converge rays of light more plus, the stronger these things, the, the 42 diopters from the cornea or the 20 from the lens, the stronger the refractive power, the quicker this is going to happen. Therefore, if it's happening behind, if the rays are coming to a, a point focus behind, it means there's not enough focal power for that system. The combination between the refractive power and the axial length where the image is going to form. And it's the result is that the image does not focus on the retina and the visual results are going to vary. And we're going to talk a little bit more detail as to why they vary. Obviously, they're going to vary based on the amount of power that this whole system is off by. And it's also going to vary depending on the age of the patient and their ability to accommodate. So why don't we jump into this whole concept of accommodation in the next slide so that we can kind of understand a little further how hyperopia affects vision. Okay, so this is where it gets kind of interesting as far as understanding why hyperopia is so much different than the other refractive errors, especially myopia being kind of like, you know, hyperopia and uh, and myopia are always compared to each other because they're kind of opposites of each other. However, the mechanism is a little bit different between the two. So again, here we have the schematic of the hyperopic eye. We have just for our purposes, we have a cornea of 42 diopters and we have a crystalline lens at a relaxed state of about 20 diopters. So if we're keeping track of this, this is about 62 diopters of power. And we know that whatever is going on, we don't care about the actual axial length here because we're not calculating all this stuff. However, we know that based on these powers and the whatever the axial length is, the image forms behind the retina here, which is ultimately bad for vision. Now, the interesting thing here is that, well, we know that in order to bring this guy back to the retina, based on what we just talked about in the previous slide, it means we need more plus power to be able to do it. Now, in the case of myopia, the, the, the eye required minus power to be able to bring things back. Well, the eye can't add its own minus power. That's just not physically possible. However, we have a wonderful structure here, the crystalline lens, which is able to accommodate and add more power. And the eye is able, not only is it able, it naturally does this on its own in order to make vision more clear. So the hyperopic patient, assuming that they still have accommodation intact, is now able to increase accommodation. And as a result, bring the rays of light onto the retina. Now, this is happening at all times for hyperopic patients, assuming that they are not presbyopic, which we're going to talk about a little bit more in detail. But as I mentioned here, accommodation to the rescue. So this essentially is kind of a built-in mechanism that the eye is able to accommodate and compensate for this hyperopic situation based on the optics of the eye and create a clear image on the retina. It adds the required converging power 
to the system. Uh, now, especially children are very good at this because they have such a strong accommodative reflex. So sometimes you can have a kid whose prescription would be somewhere like a plus three or even sometimes even higher, and they can accommodate all that power through the lens. Now, the issue here is twofold. Number one, uh, they're holding this accommodation for distance vision at all times. And, you know, the, the process of accommodation is a muscular one uh, you know, through the ciliary body and different aspects in, inside the eye. If you're holding that accommodation all day, that could be a very strainful experience. I, I usually use an like a, uh, analogy I use for a lot of my patients is, you know, if I had a, a two pound weight and I held it at the, at the end of my arms, I could probably hold it for a little bit uh, without too much strain. But if I had to hold that all day, that two pound weight would eventually feel like 20 or more. Uh, so the same concept here where your eyes, if the, if the hyperopic eye is holding a state of accommodation here for too long, this can be really strainful. Now, what effect does that have on near vision? Well, if you have the near point here and you've got this, this situation like we've talked about before with divergent rays of light coming to the eye, we know that the natural phenomenon here would be to have the, the focal point of the eye form an image behind the retina. And we know through our, you know, our discussions based on accommodation before and near point convergence is that the, uh, the crystalline lens adds more accommodative power in order to bring this back to the retina. However, if we are already using a bunch of accommodative power to hold distance vision or to improve distance vision, this guy here, the crystalline lens, ev eventually gets maxed out. So that means that there's not enough power, not enough converging or accommodative power left to bring this image back to the retina. So the eye cannot increase converging power and therefore near vision is blurry. This, there is a limit to this and it, 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 it depends 100% on what, what the person's age is or what their accommodative ability or amplitude of accommodation is. However, it's still going to affect every patient the only issue is that it's going to affect them in different ways depending on how much accommodation they have. So in the scenario I just mentioned, this child, let's say, who can accommodate three diopters to hold vision in the distance, well, they probably still have some left because some kids can have up to 10 diopters of accommodative power. Um, so in this particular scenario, it could probably still accommodate and bring these rays forward back to the retina, but at what expense? They've already expent three diopters of accommodative power in the distance. Now they're adding another three. They're holding like a plus six accommodation in order to read things. And this can, and it's important to realize this is that in the case of uh, this scenario, let's say a six year old who's constantly doing this all day, this can be very strainful. And this kind of leads to, to uh, you know, learning issues where reading becomes difficult and strainful and they can't put a finger on it. They don't know why they don't like to read, but all they know is that it's not pleasurable for them to be able to, to look clo up close and read things. And this is where you end up with a lot of cognitive delays in children due to hyperopia and it's very difficult for parents to even kind of figure it out because on the surface they look like they're able to read and, and kind of you know navigate through you know near work but it's just so much work all the time so hopefully you understand this kind of mechanism here and let's go a little bit deeper as to what it means for different types of patients and let's say different ages and before we jump into exactly what the effects are on different age groups, let's first talk about what it means to correct hyperopia and look at the mechanism behind that. So we're going to do the exact same thing as I accidentally put a little keystroke here. We're going to do the same thing as we did in myopia. We're going to take a look at what it means to have a plus three diopter hyperope and how we would correct that very similar to how we did it with the myopic eye with a minus three diopter Myope. So again, let's take a look at the schematic of uncorrected distance vision with hyperopia. We see that the image is forming behind the retina and that uh, we actually want it over here. So what does the eye do? Well, it actually adds some converging power. So if we assumed that the uh, cornea was 42 diopters and the crystalline lens prior was 20 diopters at rest, well, this guy just added about three diopters of refractive power in order to bring things into focus right here. Uh, great, right? Well, not really, because we just talked about in the previous slide how holding this state of accommodation all day is negative for the visual experience and it creates strain and it's just, well, overall bad news. So 
what, we, what do we do? Well, we add a lens to the system. So, you know, again, the hyperopic eye is not working out really well. Well, what do we do? We add a plus lens of that three diopters. And we notice here that now the lens is doing the work. The crystalline lens here is at rest. And we have a plus three diopter lens that does the work for it. So this is beautiful. So now we have the, you know, the visual schematic that we want where the retina is oh, sorry the image is formed on the retina the crystalline lens is at rest and the lens is doing the work now the other thing that this facilitates is now now oh, before we say that important to realize that what we've just done here is we have corrected the distance vision so when you see a plus lens a lot of opticians will say ah it's a reading prescription well not really we just we didn't correct reading here we corrected the distance portion we corrected the eye when it's looking at infinity what we've done because it feels like a reading prescription is because the this patient probably wasn't even complaining about distance vision in the first place but that doesn't mean they didn't have a distance issue with this whole concept that we talked about about how the eye has to hold accommodation all day long that's a distance issue without a a physical manifestation without symptoms however it doesn't mean it's not a problem now that we've corrected this, now the eye can now do normal accommodation. So if it's, you know, looking at a near point object, instead of having to use, you know, six, seven more diopters of accommodation through the lens, it can now use its normal, you know, let's just say about three diopters to, to look at something really close. And now the system operates extremely similarly to the normal eye but with the inclusion of a plus lens. So this is a very, very important concept to kind of hold in your mind that when we are correcting hyperopia, we are not necessarily correcting near vision. Well, I shouldn't even say necessarily, we're not correcting near vision, we're correcting distance vision. However, the result is that it facilitates natural near vision. Very, very important to realize this. However, there's going to be situations where we're going to have to correct both because in this particular scenario, we assumed that normal accommodation is still in play. Let's take a look at what happens when normal accommodation is no longer in play. All right, so now we get to look at hyperopia and what the effects are depending on the age. And this is where things get really interesting because, uh, you know, in most cases where we assume the hyperopia just kind of works itself out based on, you know, the natural ability of the eye, we see how these, these abilities start to fade as we get older. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to use an example of a plus three diopter hyperope, but we're going to take a look at how a young person handles this and how an older person handles it. So first, the young person, pre-presbyopic, uh, same schematic as we've used over the last few slides. The hyperopic eye produces an image behind the retina and it uh, doesn't work out well for vision. However, the crystalline lens to the rescue will converge rays of light a little bit more by adding more, let's say in this case, adding plus three diopters of accommodative power and the image is formed on the retina. This is great, except for the fact that it creates strain and it's no good. So things to remember is that this patient may not need, <clears throat> need being put in parentheses, distance correction because they don't have this perceived distance problem. Uh, they may not even need near correction because if all they're using is plus three and they're super young, they still got plenty in reserve and they may still feel like they're able to read, but they absolutely should have both distance and near correction for the reasons we outlined earlier, because we want to avoid strain. As opticians, we shouldn't necessarily just be correcting the visual problems, but we should also be correcting the underlining problems to avoid future issues. And really important here to remember, these are not reading glasses. Yes, they're going to improve reading. However, these are distance glasses. It's improving the visual uh, mechanism from distance to near the whole thing, we're avoiding strain. So that's for a young person. However, if we have an older person here and they have presbyopia, we know that the crystalline lens is now unable to add converging power. And that's gonna be kind of varying depending on age, starts around 40 years of age and it starts to decline from there. So, you know, maybe, at, you know, at this young person might be able to have, let's say, let's just use a random number, six diopters of convergence or of accommodation available. Well, every year after 40, well, actually every year of life, this continues to go down, down, down. It gets really noticeable around 40 years of age where it's just not enough to compensate for something like this scenario, a plus three diopter uh, hyper. -op. So in those cases, a 40 year old will now all of a sudden start to notice that their vision in the distance is not as clear as what it used to be. 
And you think this is super weird because they say, I've always been able to see far away, and now all of a sudden I can't. It's because the crystalline lens is no longer able to converge the power. So in these scenarios, someone who may not have been correct in the past, a plus three diopter probably would have been correct in the past, but let's say someone's like a plus one or something like that. Uh, they've always been able to accommodate this. However, now they can't, and now all of a sudden they need correction. So what do we do? We add a lens in here, and now in this case, we add the plus three lens, and the rays of light are converged on to the retina. Great. So what kind of experience does this older person get now with this scenario? Well, first of all, we know that they will require distance correction due to the re reduced accommodative ability of the eye. We've already talked about that, and this is where we throw this lens in. And of course, uh, as they get older, they're going to become more and more dependent on this correction. Now, with no accommodation, the distance blur will be as significant as myopia in the same magnitude. This is really important to realize because people think, oh, well, they're, they're a hyperope, so they must see kind of okay in the distance. Uh, no, not really. The only reason they see kind of okay in the distance is because they might still have some accommodative ability from the lens. If you take an, not an aphakic, but a pseudophakic patient, meaning somebody who has their crystalline lens replaced after cataract surgery, that lens doesn't flex anymore and they get zero, zero, zero accommodation. Those patients, a plus two diopter hyperope will be just as blurred in distance as a minus two diopter myope. That's extremely important to realize because the only reason you see well in the distance with hyperopia is due to accommodation. You remove that completely and you're just as blurred as a myope is. And finally here, absol absolutely will require near correction because now the same concept that we talked about earlier, the near point convergence of the eye as the rays of light diverge away, they're going to end up behind the retina here and there's no accommodation whatsoever we already are behind the eight ball here with the fact that the eye is already already hyperopic so they're going to require a significant amount of power to be able to correct near vision so this in a nutshell is kind of why hyperopia is often misunderstood because we just assume that they see well in the distance and they don't do well up close which is not completely incorrect for young people. However, as they age, which they inevitably will, things get worse and worse and worse to a point where an 80-year-old hyperope who's had cataract surgery, who has a lens implant, will be just as compromised in the distance as any other patient. In fact, will be even more compromised up close than the myope because at least the myope can see up close due to the reasons we talked about with the near point convergence or the, sorry, the, 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 focal length of the eye being naturally or suited for near vision. All right, this is a good time to kind of go over the summary of what we talked about today. I'm hoping that you get a bit of a better understanding of what hyperopia is all about. And this slide here is just kind of to hammer everything home one last time, the points that you should be thinking about whenever you are thinking about hyperopia. So the first thing that, this is the simple one, that the converging power of the eye is too weak for the overall length of the eye and the, this causes the image to form behind the retina. This is something that you should know already. Um, however, something we covered today that you may not have always been thinking about is that the accommodative reflex of the eye can mask hyperopia and that results in adequate distance vision. And we talked about the fact that for younger people, this is very much the case, but as they age, this masking ability starts to diminish and they all of a sudden become just as blurred as, as potentially as a myope would be. Uh, this is still a distance prescription. Stop calling them reading glasses. Oh, I'm telling you, if, if you take anything from this presentation, I hope that it's that, uh, you know, they are not reading glasses. Calling them reading glasses is actually really bad because especially for young patients, because when you're talking to the young patient and to their parents, this insinuates that they should only be wearing them up close. I have seen patients with like plus five prescriptions. They're like 10 years old and I hear them called reading glasses and the parents just assume, well, you're just going to wear these to read and you'll be okay. And there's no way that this is how this should be used. So stop calling them reading glasses. Now it's important to realize too that presbyopic patients will by far be the most affected by hyperopia because they lose that ability, that masking ability in a distance and near objects suck as well. They can't see anything from far to close without correction. So always keep an eye out for your presbyopic hyperopes because they are the ones who need your help the most. Uh, and unaccommodated hyperopia can have a lar as large of an impact as myopia at the same magnitude, especially 
in pseudo phacic patients. So remember, meaning they've had cataract surgery, they have implants that have no accommodation. And in that case, they are just as far off as a myope where distance is blurred, near is blurred, and everything kind of sucks. And that pretty much does it for the presentation on hyperopia. I hope that this was helpful in kind of understanding the little nuances and how this differs a little bit from myopia um, and how important it is to kind of understand the mechanism, not kind of, completely understand the mechanism behind this refractive error so that you can understand what the patient is experiencing. And even when they're not experiencing anything, you can understand what's going on in the background so that you can be a better optician and correct things the way they should be. So like I said, I hope you enjoyed this. Make sure to join us next week when we cover astigmatism, another one that is widely misunderstood. All right, see you next time. All right, I hope you enjoyed this week's video. And remember, if you have any questions about any of the stuff we cover, make sure to leave a comment down below. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications for all our future videos. I can't wait to see you in the next one. Bye now.